Today we've assembled a panel of labor leaders in our local area to speak on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. A proposed free trade agreement that would set policy governing approximately 40% of the global economy. And it has been fast-tracked to Congress and is awaiting for ratification. Hello, everybody. Uh, uh, I'm up here because I guess uh, Shannon was at a gathering somewhere and someone said that the ILW must support the TPP because, uh, because you know, we rely on, on trade. Um, but for the record, the ILWU, um, its members, including officers, have been publicly opposing the TPP um, for years. In June 2012, at the 35th uh, ILWU uh, International Convention, the ILWU passed a resolution opposing the TPP um, later in 2012. July 2nd, 2012, the, there were ILW members uh, protesting outside TPP talks, also in San Diego. Uh, the wife of an ILW member protesting there said that they protested because corporate lobbyists want these talks in San Diego to be a secret, so we decided to blow the whistle and help expose what's happening. December 1st, 2012, Lane Washington on the U.S.-Canada border, uh, joined by the Secretary of the New Zealand Longshore Union and ILW members from the United States as Canada and Canada, as well as representatives from the International Transport Workers Federation. Um, ILW Vice President Ray Famoletti said, maritime and transport workers around the world are mobilizing against these secretive, undemocratic, and anti-worker free trade deals like the TPP. These, deal, these deals aren't free and aren't fair to workers. They undermine secure jobs and health and safety conditions, and they are part of a wider push to give even more power and control to corporate interests. This consistent drumbeat of opposition in union halls, on the telephone, with congressional members, uh, and in public demonstrations shows that not only is the ILW opposed to the TPP, but we feel it's incumbent on, on us to do something about it. Here in Oregon, we have been making those calls to members of Congress discussing the ramifications of the TPP uh, amongst ourselves and for, and the ramifications on people like us and other workers and participating in rallies and other gatherings in opposition. The reasons brought up here, the reasons I think that we all came here um, parallel several of the reasons that members of the ILW have directed the organization to oppose the TPP. The ILW exists and remains effective to the degree that our members understand that an injury to one is an injury to all. Um, our opposition is also in line with the 10 guiding principles adopted by the ILWU uh, founders of the 1953 convention as they labored under McCarthyism. Um, the eighth guiding principle reads, uh, the basic aspirations and desires of the workers throughout the world are the same. Workers are workers the world over. International solidarity, particularly to maritime workers, is essential to their protection and a guarantee of reserve economic power in times of strife. In addition to its locals in Alaska, Canada, Hawaii, and Panama, the ILWU maintains relationship with maritime workers throughout the Pacific Rim and the world. In recent years, the ILWU has reinforced workers in distress in Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, Japan, Honduras, Panama, and Colombia, among others around the world. We support resources, and union representation for seafarers who crew the ships and labor under third world conditions on vessels right here in our ports when they are not at sea. We, we participate in efforts by the International Transport Workers Federation, an organization that has worked to protect the rights of transport workers, uh, including those in, in uh, developing nations uh, since 1896. Longshoremen have always been temporary workers. Our workplace floats in on a totally unpredictable schedule, and then it's gone as soon as our work is done. It takes, it used to take 30 days to service a ship, and now we're lucky if it takes 30 hours. Sometimes a ship will be completely serviced and, and ready to go back to sea in five hours. Uh, we have a front row seat to the trade deficit. In Portland, we have three docks that handle auto imports, and only one dock that handles exports, and the exports are much lower volume. In the Oregon area, we export raw logs, wood chips, mineral bulk cargo, scrap metal, and grain. And we import wood mills, steel slabs, 
steel pipe and other manufactured <coughs> goods. In my 12 years on the waterfront, working throughout the Northwest, I've only handled uh, units of lumber on a ship once, and I don't know that it was even for export. Uh, all the value is added overseas. Um, Vancouver, Washington even discharged a whole prefabricated factory using two 120 ton cranes for giant tandem picks. Most of our manu manufactured exports go out in, by containers, so we don't get to see what's inside those containers, uh, like the longshoremen who came before. But when our container terminal was operating, we had a large area of the yard dedicated just to empty containers for em export. Um, according to a recent Huffington Post article by Lori Wallach, Director of Public Citizens Global Trade Watch, Quote, U.S. export growth to countries that are not free trade agreement or FTA partners has exceeded U.S. export growth to FTA partners. So in other words, where there isn't a free trade agreement, we export more. By, and that was by 29% over the past decade. By the end of 2015, the aggregate U.S. trade deficit with FTA partners had increased by 418% since the FTAs were implemented, while that with all non-FTA countries had actually decreased by 6%. Longshoremen see the trade deficit. The ILW direct deals directly with some of the most powerful players in global trade. Shipping lines are fickle. If conditions are not perfect in one port, they will quickly find another to work their ships. ILW locals still compete in speed and efficiency to try to attract shipping lines. And, but we are all protected by a coastwise contract and a safety book that sets a minimum industrial standard so we don't have to endure the atrocious conditions that people had to prior to the 1934 coastwise agreement. Well the, well, the first one. Before I hand off the mic, I want to close with another of the ILW's 10 guiding principles that helps explain why the ILW has opposed NAFTA and other so-called free trade agreements since. The, long, the days are long gone when a union can consider dealing with single employers. The powerful financial interests of the country are bound together in every conceivable type of united organization to promote their own welfare and to resist the demands of labor. Labor can no more win with the ancient weapons of taking on a single employer in industry any more than it can hope to win through the worn out dreams of withholding its skill until an employer sues for peace. The employers of this country are part of a well-organized carefully coordinated, effective fighting machine. They can be met on equal terms, which re they, only on equal terms, excuse me, which requires industry-wide bargaining and the most extensive economic strength of organized labor. And that was 1953. Now, now we're talking about global corporations that are organized uh, and working together against us. Today, it's not enough for labor to reach out to labor to win these battles. We need we need to organize with human rights and environmental organizations and anyone who will be affected by climate change and bring them to our efforts to find a better way to engage in global trade. Remember, next time somebody says you are anti-trade for opposing the TPP or says that you must not care about workers overseas because you oppose the TPP, know that the ILWU stands with you and we absolutely support international trade and global labor solidarity. Because there are no labor or environmental protections written into the language, and because foreign partner corporations can sue federal, state, local, or any level of government for unfair trade laws or advantages, there are a lot of things that are going to be affected by the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And I'm gonna say about eight things that I think are really important for the construction world, for the construction trades, but also are very important, again, for manufacturing and service work as well. First of all, foreign firms in more countries will be given equal access to government contracts. And of course, a lot of uh, union building, union construction is on government type contracts. Um, firms operating in any TPP signatory country would be given equal access to the vast majority of U.S. federal procurement contracts. And Buy American would be basically a thing of the distant past 
as governments would be required to accept the lowest bid regardless. The prevailing wage, another thing that would definitely be a thing of the past. That would be an unfair trade advantage and it's a peculiarly U.S. law and as such is subject to the construction corporations in partner company, countries to sue the U.S. government. Without prevailing wage laws, unionized contractors would be at a disadvantage in building for, bidding for government building jobs, many of which require the lowest bid to be adopted. Union wages and benefits in general, with equal competition for construction corporations from other countries, and the allowing of them to pay lower wages, the downward pressure on U.S. labor contracts would be uh, huge. <coughs> Safety. Safety laws are different from state to state in the United States, much less the federal OSHA law. Uh, although, although each state must adhere to at least the minimum safety laws under federal OSHA, Either state laws that are more strict or the federal OSHA laws would not be protected under the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I think this is something very important. In construction, construction is a very dangerous, uh, that's very dangerous work. And safety laws right now are at a very minimum for ensuring safety of the workers in, on construction sites. They really aren't where they really should be. If you talk to any safety activists in the state of Oregon, they'll tell you it's not enough. And yet, uh, states or the federal government would be at risk of being sued for too stringent safety laws, just like environmental laws, and, cons and uh, construction workers would be at a definite uh, uh, risk. Uh, for example, the 15-hour minimum wage or a higher minimum in Oregon, which would lay it, raise the wages of laborers on city contract jobs, for example, would be at risk. Uh, project labor agreements, these are very, very important. These project labor agreements, we've had some that have been fabulous. Not only did we get union construction uh, jobs out of these PLAs, but we also got an agreement not to oppose organizing the service workers who would then be working at these jobs, at jobs at, for example, a hotel that would be built under a project labor agreement. Metro, Metro Zoo Remodel has a PLA that also secures a certain number of minority-owned and women-owned business enterprises to be part of that construction. Um, with, <laughs> with that, that would be definitely challenged by any sort of foreign corporation, and you, you understand that and a, a U.S. company could have a foreign corporation as, as their headquarters. They could have a foreign country as their headquarters of a subsidiary that would then bid on this work so that they can then sue their own country. And so it sounds really complicated, but honestly, uh, almost everything that we've worked for would be destroyed in a matter of months. Things that we've worked for in the labor movement since, uh, well, since the eight hour day, you know, since the turn of the, of the uh, 20th century. Uh, government sponsored environmentally sustainable building, lead building, and to, including tax incentives to make sure that these uh, buildings are environmentally sustainable would be challenged. This and environmental re retrofitting are two growth construction areas. These are two areas that would definitely be challenged because there's no environmental, uh, there are no environmental uh, guarantees and there's no guarantee that they would say that this is unfair. Uh, government funds for pre-apprenticeship and appre apprenticeship programs <coughs> could be challenged. Uh, these training programs are what standardize work, guarantee that workers understand and follow safety and other building codes, and assure the higher standards of how things are built and don't fall down. And there are now very few middle class wage jobs in this country that, that you can just get with a high school diploma and some advanced mathematics. And the trades are one of them. Going into an apprenticeship of one of them. This would, this would help 
accelerate the destruction of the uh, middle class. Uh, call center and other service center uh, work is at, is at risk. Call centers, there's a lot of call centers. Um, there were call centers uh, all over the place here in Oregon and a lot of them have shut down. Uh, the one in Bend, 400 workers who work for T-Mobile, it was shut down and moved uh, overseas through NAFTA. And, uh, and CWA, even though we didn't represent them, sued the federal government to make sure that they got trade assistance. Uh, T-Mobile opposed that. And interestingly, is no skin off their teeth. They didn't pay into it. They didn't have to pay for it. Uh, it was free to them, but apparently it wasn't bad enough that they laid off 400 people in uh, Eastern Oregon. They also had to, um, they also had to try to oppose their trade assistance. Uh, and finally, the tra Trans-Pacific Partnership would be forever. It's not really just about trade. It's a mechanism to make the world safe for the, uh, for the 1% to do whatever they want, whenever they want to amass even more money than they have now for no other reason except greed. Uh, once the Trans-Pacific Partnership is signed, unlike, un unlike domestic laws, it would have no expiration date. It could only be altered by a consensus of all the signatories, all the countries, locked in, locking in failed extreme policies, locking in partnerships with, with ty tyrannies like Vietnam and Brunei, and Indonesia, and it's a docking agreement so that other Pacific Rim countries, such as the tyranny of China, would also be able in the future to join. Um, I guess I, I feel like I've, I've uh, tr beaten the drum against the Trans-Pacific Partnership for years now, but uh, Every time I've seen any of my representatives, I have said to them, you must vote no on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I've almost given up on um, one of our senators, um, who apparently would rather represent New York 1% interest than Oregon. But I really believe that it's important for, for people who are regular workers, who people who go to work every day, they pay their taxes, you need to tell them that this has got to stop. This is just, it's just ridiculous and uh, it's only hurting the people, it's only hurting our families and our economy. So, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm curious, um, how many of you have used paper products in the last, say, 30 days? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me try to narrow it down. How about the last week? Uh, an hour. How many of you have used paper products or wood products probably in the last 30 seconds? <laughs> so you'll hear from a lot of the politicians and people that the paper industry is a dead and dying industry. Again, that's their excuse or one of their excuses for why we're losing our jobs. Since NAFTA, of all the mills that we represent in the Pacific Northwest, our, our union is based in, in the Pacific Northwest, every location that is either closed or had layoffs have been a true, approved for the NAFTA benefits and then which became the trade adjustment assistance, the TA benefits. You only get those benefits if there's, if there's an investigation by the Department of Labor and they determine that the major reason that you lost your job was due to unfair trade. Every mill, and I'll, I'll just go through a quick list of, just in Oregon to give you an example. North Bend, Oregon, warehouser mill closed. 220 people lost their jobs. That equipment was dismantled, moved overseas, and brought back online. Albany, Oregon, the paper mill in Albany, warehouser owned it. They, well, it's gone through a number of owners, just like a lot of the mills. Uh, International Paper was the last owner. It closed 270 people, and these are direct jobs I'm talking about. And that equipment was dismantled, moved overseas, brought back online. It's kind of ironic, the Albany mill had just built a state-of-the-art boiler. Um, they got tax breaks from Oregon to buy the equipment and install it. Salem, Oregon, Boise Cascade closed. 100 people lost their jobs. 
The equipment was moved overseas, brought back online. Oregon City, Blue Heron Mill, closed. 300 people lost their jobs there. That equipment was sold, moved overseas, brought back online. Newburgh, Oregon Mill, West Rock. That mill's gone through a tough time. You'll hear John talk about it. They emerged out of uh, bankruptcy, got bought by a company, West Rock, huge uh, multinational corporation. Two weeks after their purchase, they closed the mill. And that equipment is either going to, some of the equipment will be moved to South America or to Mexico. Um, and over 260 people lost their jobs. For all the other remaining mills in the United States, they've all retooled or in, in the Pacific Northwest, but most all mills in the United States have retooled to run recycled paper product, or recycled paper for recycling. Every one of these mills that closed had invested into energy efficient equipment uh, and processes to reduce their carbon footprint. Blue Heron paper mill, and don't get me wrong, the mills are ugly, you look at them, right? They're not, they're not a, a place you want to go sightsee. The Blue Heron Mill ran 100% recovered paper, recycled paper. They had orders for a year going out when they closed and filed bankruptcy. They filed bankruptcy in part because they could not compete against the Chinese for purchasing recycled paper. Portland area is known as a great recycled city. Right? Crazy. West Rock, the mill in Newburgh, ran 100% recovered recycled paper. Oregon no longer has any mills that run 100% recycled paper. It's absolutely crazy. 70% right now, currently, 70% of our paper that we recycle is shipped overseas. I think most people in Portland area are, you know, that love to recycle and we're doing it to help the environment, right? I think most people, pardon my French, would be pissed if they knew that that's what's going on. We're helping the Chinese and others kick our butt in manufacturing. And the plant closures are not just a problem for Oregon. I'll go through a short list. Warehouse of Longview, the mill I was out of, the, they made copy paper. They closed in 2004. That equipment was completely dismantled, put in 255 containers, shipped overseas. Shangdong Paper bought the mill for the paper equipment and brought back online, selling the same product under the warehouser name. Incredible. Warehouser got tax breaks when they bought the equipment. Georgia Pacific Camus, uh, Washington, downsized, paper machines closed, equipment moved overseas. Kimberly Clark up in Everett was uh, Everett, Washington. 800 people worked there, direct jobs, a little over. They had just put in state-of-the-art paper machines. And a lot of these machines, they have copyrights on them on the, on the engineering stuff. They closed, Kimberly Clark in um, the late 90s made a corporate decision that they were going to exit their manufacturing in the United States. They hardly have anything left. The paper machines, the state of the art paper machines there, were dismantled and shipped to Mexico. I could go through a list. Bob Tagus here, who's worked on a, a lot of uh, trade adjustment applications. I mean, the, the, you can go online to the Department of Labor and you can search by company or by uh, state or a number of it. I suggest uh, you do that sometime and look. It's, it's unbelievable the amount of places that have been certified for trade adjustment. Now, for every one of our jobs that are lost, there's been a number of studies that say a, a, a good round number, actually it's not round, it's odd, no, is uh, for every one of our jobs, there's five direct other jobs lost. So, you know, you do the math and there's this terrible ripple effect. And most of these places where the mills close, the mills are the single largest tax source <coughs> for the area. So the ripple effect back through the government and the services is, is very bad. A chemical plant called, a, up at, or a chemical plant in Kalama, Washington, just closed about 30 days ago. The reason they closed is because the West Rock Mill closed. West Rock Mill was the, and Newburgh was their last major customer. So then you have the ripple effect through, through that on all, you know, and again it was manufacturing. As I said, the pulp and paper industry certainly is not a dying industry. Uh, as countries become more civilized, you know, you look at India and other ones, there's a lot of facial uh, tissue, toilet paper and things. So again, you know, you look at Bonamici and other ones, Kurt Schrader's been terrible about it. 
when the Newburgh mill closed, he said, you know, that's not really the type of industry we want in the United States. He said that. I'm sure he uses toilet paper. No, it's not. <laughs> China's bringing on state-of-the-art paper machines every month. They now have the biggest, fastest, most technological advanced paper machines in the world. And this, this is just an example of you know, what's happening with the paper industry. All manufacturing in the United States has been doing, going through this. I mean, I don't know how many of you have seen the announcement of Boeing's intent to build a manufacturing plant in China. Boeing got over $5 billion tax breaks from, from the state of Washington, while the state legislature is being sued for not funding education. And those tax breaks <coughs> had no strings attached. Boeing threatened to leave the state if they didn't get it. By giving them the money, you actually help them lose, leave sooner, and that is what's happening. And then with all the closures, and the shift of manufacturing, you know, we have this negative impact on, on climate change and the CO2 emissions. Worldwide emissions have been going up. And going up, it, you know, there's uh, groups that monitor it within industries, and it's been going up within the paper industry. You know, China pays about $1.90 an hour. India pays $0.10 cents an hour. China's worried about the exit of the pulp and paper industry from China to countries like India and others, because China doesn't have the raw materials. Two weeks ago, China announced that uh, they're going to build a $1.4 billion pulp mill in the United States. They're not going to make product here. They need the fiber to ship overseas to make the, the paper products that they're going to use. Now, the, and that's the impact, obviously, of the trade agreements. Now, let's look at the jobs that we keep. Every contract we negotiate has been concession, whether it's loss of defined pensions, uh, move to these enhanced 401ks, uh, medical, because of that unfair economic advantage that these companies have. And you'll hear, uh, like Bonamici has said before, and other ones in Schrader have said, well, you know, it's not really the wages. That's not, that doesn't have any impact on why they're leaving. Well, like BS. If wages don't matter, why do we fight so hard to get a 1% pay raise for it? You know, it's just crazy what they're saying. So. So then with all of this, you know, you'll hear Bonamici and other ones, Schrader, talk about the national deficit. They're all concerned about the national deficit. Did you ever hear them talk about the trade deficit? We run $800 billion a year trade deficit. And this has been going on for a long time. If they cared about the national deficit, truly, and wanted to take action, they'd go after the trade deficit. We've lost our tax base. We've had a couple of wars that weren't paid for. You know, we won't go through all that list, but uh, it's absolutely crazy. This is what's been going on. And they'll tell you how many jobs are created through these trade agreements. You know, I, I joke that the 10th grade was the three best years of my life, but let me give you a little math, math <laughs> equation. What's five plus five? It's 10, right? What's 10? So they'll stop there. They'll say, oh, we added this. Well, what's 10 plus minus 20? What's oh, minus 10? They'll focus only on the exports. There's, You've heard they won't look at the imports they focus on the jobs that were created they don't look at the jobs that were lost since the korea free trade agreement passed four years ago we were promised 70,000 jobs in the united states instead we've lost 106,000. our trade deficit with them has gone up fourfold and then you'll hear bonamici and others um, senator wyden say well we're going to go after enforcement you know this is the answer these trade agreements are going to have these strong rules and regulations and enforcement. Enforcement is after you've lost your job, after your kids have dropped out of college, after you've lost your house. And then when there's enforcement, it goes to these multinational corporations anyway. They're the ones that get the money. It doesn't go back to the people that lost their jobs or the communities that have been devastated by it. So I'll, uh, I'll end with that, but it's, you know, it's, as I said, this is an example of what's happening in the pulp and paper industry. And every manufacturing Industry in the United States has been decimated by these, uh, you know, by the trade agreements. We have the cleanest, most stringent environmental rules and regulations in the world. And, you know, then you have this huge negative impact on the environment along with everything else. So, 
there's not much as obviously as we all know, and I'm preaching to the choir, but that has happened with the job loss and what's been going on. So thanks. So I'm going to talk about human rights and I'm going to talk about workers' rights in other countries and the places where these jobs move to. What are the impacts on people there? Right? And it's really important to distinguish between the companies and where they're from and the workers who work there. Because the workers who are working in the places, um, whether we're talking about Mexico or Vietnam, Malaysia or Brunei, um, or in the future, right, some of the folks mentioned like China and Korea, those workers are not being treated well. They're often uh, being treated with conditions that are incredibly worse. Uh, what advocates in the migrant workers uh, human rights world talk about as modern day slavery. Right, that is, those are the conditions that many of these folks are working under. Um, and we have a lot of lessons from the past. As people mentioned, uh, other free trade agreements, including the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, the Central American Free Trade Agreement, CAFTA, or even unilateral agreements between the US and another country, uh, we have lots of examples of what the impacts have been already on workers, right? So, I'm gonna, so we're going to talk about the state of labor rights and commitments among the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, countries. Respect for labor rights is at the core of increasing jobs, raising wages, and creating broadly shared prosperity. The TPP fails to strengthen international labor rights protections. Uh, there are extensive and well-documented labor problems in at least four of the TPP countries, Mexico, Vietnam, Brunei, and Malaysia, and the administration has not committed to requiring all countries to be in full compliance with international labor standards before they get benefits under the agreement. Workers' rights obligations have never been fully enforced under existing free trade agreements. Let me say that again. Workers' rights obligations have never been fully enforced under existing free trade agreements. We don't think it'll happen under this one either. Um, and so there's been a lot of discretion for the few complaints that make it to, the, to any kind of international level. Um, those complaints are often delayed for years or indefinitely. They are never addressed. Um, let's see. The TPP includes countries with entrenched labor and human rights abuses that are unlikely to be solved during the short implementation period. And each partner country is assessed on the basis of its adherence to the ILO, the International Labor Organization's five fundamental labor rights. And these should sound familiar. The right to freedom of association, the right to collectively bargain, the abolition of forced or compulsory labor, and the abolition of child labor and non-discrimination and harassment on the job. Let's see. So in Mexico, Many of you may know, but we're just going to go through this quickly. The human and labor rights situation in Mexico is rapidly deteriorating. How many of you heard about the 43 students who disappeared and were murdered in Ayotzinapa? Yeah. Right? That's the conditions under which workers and, and labor <coughs> organizing exist in Mexico as well. Um, Mexico currently fails to adopt and implement laws that protect the ILO's core labor standards. The Department of State, uh, the U.S. Department of State's Human Rights Report in 2014 on Mexico said, the government did not consistently protect workers' rights in practice. Its general failure to enforce labor and other laws left workers without much recourse with regard to violations of freedom of association, working conditions, and other problems. One of the main reasons is the use of so-called protection contracts. Protection contracts are agreements mask that <coughs> Masquerading as collective bargaining agreements, but they're signed between an employer and an employer-dominated union, often without the knowledge of the rank-and-file workers. It is one of the most serious threats to freedom of association and collective bargaining in Mexico. <clears throat> in these workplaces, workers are governed by contracts that have never been ratified, they've never been consulted on, and in many cases, the workers don't even know they exist. When workers try to bring complaints about the, the contracts, they're heard by a board in the government called the Conciliation and Arbitration Board, which are politically biased and corrupt. Instead of ensuring that workers can exercise their rights under Mexican and international law, the CABs and labor authorities and sometimes privately hired or public police forces have interfered with workers' freedom of association. 
This situation has presented itself at the work sites of many multinational companies, including Atento, Exelon, Honda, PKC, and Texit. In the agricultural sector, as many of you know, child labor, forced labor, and inhumane working conditions exist on farms that export fresh produce into the United States. How many of you have heard about the Boycott Driscoll's campaign? Right? These are directly linked. Uh, the human rights violations on those farms will be exacerbated by free trade agreements like the TPP. Um, let's see, I'll skip the union certification process. Please ask me if you want to know more <laughs> later on. Um, but in short, the NAFTA has contributed to labor abuses and not improvements. NAFTA also contributed to the massive displacement of Mexican campesinos, people who work on the land. Some of these workers searched for promised new jobs in the maquilas on the border. Many others migrated north to the United States, either through irregular channels or by utilizing exploitative labor recruitment forms and guest worker visa programs. Those workers, when they get here, are often subject to extreme exploitation, trafficking conditions, and labor rights violations. Meanwhile, as our brothers and sisters on the panel here have mentioned, companies have shifted manufacturing work to Mexico to take advantage of displaced workers and, and farmhands and people who own their land, peasants, and other impoverished people who lack the most basic workplace uh, protections. There's nothing in the TPP's labor chapter that would ensure that Mexico's history of worker ex uh, abuse and exploitation will be remedied. Do we want to go into policy or are you going to do that now? Whatever works for you. <laughs> okay. Uh, there are no provisions added to the enforcement section to ensure monitoring or enforcement of labor obligations um, or that they will be deliberate, consistent, timely, vigilant, effective, or automatic. Many labor organizations, including the National AFL-CIO, submitted comments on the TPP, and those comments were not were barely addressed and not taken into consideration, did not make it into the final agreement. Um, and there's not a consistency plan or a side agreement for Mexico, despite the US government's extensive knowledge of problems uh, with workers, for workers in Mexico due to these agreements. Similarly, CAFTA, or the unilateral agreements like the one with Colombia, have not protected labor unionists from death threats and even assassination. For example, in, in Guatemala, under the Central American Free Trade Agreement, it was ratified in 2006. According to labor groups, more than 70 union organizers have been killed in the decades since Guatemala signed the agreement. It took over 10 years for the U.S. to bring any cases against Guatemala for the violation of the core standards of the labor agreement. And this is the first and only time the US has ever brought a case against another country for a labor chapter violation under a free trade agreement. It will likely to take many more years for the Guatemala case to be decided. Colombia is also an example of where the side agreement that was made on labor protections has not mitigated the dangers of being a worker or a union organizer. During the first year, of the free trade agreement between Colombia and the United States, uh, the number of Colombian union members violently displaced from their homes has increased, and death threats against unionists have remained, according to the Escuela Nacional Sindical, the institution that's recognized as the authoritative source on monitoring data. The number of unionists violently forced to flee their homes jumped 76% in 2012 compared to 2011 before the FTA took effect. Death threats against unionists have remained rampant with 471 unionists receiving death threats in the year after the us Columbia Free Trade Agreement Labor Action Plan was launched. In 2012, at least 20 Colombian unionists were assassinated. Last year, oh, there were 35, 35 assassinated. So we know that free trade agreements have not protected workers' rights in countries where there's known violence. In some cases, violence against unionists has increased under uh, free trade agreements. The current state of human rights in other countries like Vietnam, Malaysia, and Brunei, and I'm gonna try and be quick here, um, are likely to be exacerbated 
under free trade agreements, they're going to get worse. And for the workers with the least protections. Vietnam's government limits political rights, civil liberties, and freedom of association. The government maintains a prohibition on independent human rights organizations and other civil society groups. Without the freedom to exercise fundamental labor rights, labor abuses in Vietnam are pervasive. Wages are artificially suppressed. Uh, or Vietnamese workers do not have the opportunity to escape poverty. And that puts US and other workers at a disadvantage in the global market. The Vietnamese government also currently restricts union activity outside of the officially government-sponsored unions. Workplace-level government-sponsored unions generally have management serving in leadership positions. And when that is not the case, workers cannot meet as the union without management present. This effectively bars the ability of people to establish independent unions in Vietnam. There's also no right to strike. When people have had wildcat strikes and held industrial actions outside of state-sponsored unions, they, that has led to government retaliation, including persecution and imprisonment. Uh, let's see. Vietnam also has significant problems with forced labor and child labor. The US Department of Labor finds that child labor is prevalent in the production of bricks and the production of garments. Forced labor and human trafficking is also prevalent in the garment sector and the informal economy. Many of the clothes uh, produced in, contain textiles produced in small workshops that are subcontracted to larger factories in Vietnam. This is also true in LA. These workshops frequently use child labor, including forced labor, where children have been trafficked from rural areas into the cities. <clears throat> For Vietnam, we know that uh, Malaysia has grave problems with every one of the five fundamental labor rights. First of all, there's profound failures to protect workers from forced labor and trafficking. So, you know, Greg mentioned the pulp and paper mills here. Um, a lot of, they, in Malaysia, I used to work in Malaysia for a short amount of time. I worked with indigenous groups there. And indigenous groups in Malaysia don't have uh, their native land, their native rights, right? The land is officially government run. The only way that some of the indigenous groups can get the right to their own land, their historical territories, is to enter into an agreement with the Malaysian government to grow either palm oil, palms, or eucalyptus for pulp and paper. And when that happens, the workers on those plantations are often trafficked from elsewhere. And so on the international level, when these jobs are lost here, not only are we losing great jobs and um, security for families here, that's the job of Portland's Jobs with Justice here in town, right? It leads to violations of indigenous sovereignty in places like Malaysia and Mexico, but also increases, again, the workers on those plantations are trafficked. Um, those are extremely bad working conditions. And uh, people lose their ancestral territory, their ancestral homelands. Let's see. The majority of victims of forced labor in Malaysia are the country's four million migrant workers, 40% of the overall workforce. Migrant workers, again, that requires US workers to compete um, with workers that have no basic human rights protections. Uh, there's also the same issues with freedom of association. Um, my friends who used to work on labor rights as well as indigenous rights were jailed by the Malaysian government. One of them has a permanent limp, limp for the rest of his life because of the beatings that he received in prison. Um, migrants to Malaysia face a range of abuses relating to their recruitment and placement, and they're often threatened with deportation for speaking out. And, and some of the recognizable electronics brands, especially in these sort of like free trade zones or um, work zones, include Intel, Advanced Micro Devices, Dell, and Flextronics. Uh, this one. Verite interviewed more than 500 workers and found that approximately 28% of electronics workers toil in conditions of forced labor. Additionally, 73% of those workers reported violations that put them at risk for forced labor, including outsourcing, debt from recruitment fees, constrained movement, isolation, and uh, their documents being taken away from them. In May of 2015, Malaysian police uncovered 139 graves in the jungle alongside abandoned cages used to detain migrant workers. This is an operation that's so massive that many believe local officials were complicit. 
And then yet, the US State Department um, upgraded Malaysia I mean, shortly thereafter in its annual trafficking in persons report from tier three, which is the worst, to tier two. In under tier three, um, Malaysia would have been under threat of trade restrictions under the TPP. As a tier two country, Malaysia is no longer under threat of those trade restrictions. Let's see. And so, given that Malaysia could be rewarded with greater market access under the Trans-Pacific Partnership without first having to enforce the changes that it promises to make on paper, there will be little incentive for the government to end exploitative working conditions or the brutality of forced labor after entry into the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Finally, the situation in Brunei is, is really extreme. Despite, despite widespread calls from US labor, LGBTQ and human rights groups to exclude Brunei from the TPP, it appears the agreement and the consistency plan are going to end, the US and Brunei will enter into permanent trading relationship without ensuring that working families can exercise their fundamental human and labor rights in Brunei. There's 85,000 migrant workers in Brunei who face labor exploitation and trafficking related to debt bondage from labor recruitment, wage theft, passport confiscation, abuse, and confinement. Again, the Brunei signed letter seems likely to be partially implemented on paper, but likely will continue to leave workers without the ability to free, freely exercise their fundamental rights. So to conclude, the TPP as currently written is troubling in numerous ways. The agreement covers not just traditional trade issues such as tariffs and quotas, but sets rules that limits our democracy and how our government can regulate in the public interest. The TPP creates new and expansive legal rights for foreign investors, including their very own private legal system that is outside the reach of US courts. The current labor chapter, even with improved language, does not represent a counterbalance to the protections and privilege gained by corporations. In the TPP, the interests of workers and the promotion of their rights are embedded in a failed model. The labor movement now has decades of experience with labor rights language and trade agreements. And as documented by the Government Accountability Office, the US government does little to actively monitor or enforce commitments made in labor sections of free trade agreements. Unlike the corporations, workers do not have the power to initiate complaints and must petition to their governments to advocate on their behalf. For workers denied their rights, trying to convince another government uh, to initiate a complaint on the rights of foreign workers has resulted in an unworkable process. The fact is no worker in the global economy has won the right to form an independent union and to bargain collectively as a result of the enforcement of workers' rights provisions in a trade group. There have not been monetary fines or tariffs imposed for labor violations in those agreements. So finally, uh, I think the solutions that labor has proposed is that to support a people-centered trade approach that will guarantee the benefits of trade can actually improve the working and living lives of millions of workers and their families in the United States and throughout the TPP countries. Um, one thing that we've heard a little bit about today, um, but you may have also heard outside of today's event, is that the TPP has a lot that has absolutely nothing to do with trade in it. But what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to talk about one of the few places where it does deal with trade, and that's the concept of protectionism, which is becoming a very interesting word, particularly with regards to the current presidential state of the presidential race. Um, but one thing that we've been hearing, and you may have heard as well, is a new, relatively new talking point about the TPP. It has 18,000 tax cuts. Tax cuts are good, right? No. And that's the selling point. Well, and I'm sorry I didn't make a bigger version of this, but thankfully it's pretty bright. See that pie chart? And I'll start with my panelists so they can see it. See the red in the pie chart? It's more than half. Those are the tariff cuts under which the US exports nothing. So we've already taken this $18,000 number, whether you agree or disagree with tariff cuts, and we are not going to benefit from those cuts as a country. Um, but then you get into some of the unique places that these tariff cuts exist, and you recognize even more what you've heard the panelists say, which is 
This is not about reducing protectionism or tax cuts. This is about centralizing power in the hands of the 1% and multinational corporations. So um, first thing on this 18,000 number, we already have free trade agreements with um, several TPP countries. You heard a lot about Mexico, Canada, members of NAFTA, um, Colombia is a TPP, no, sorry, Colombia is not. Peru is a TPP country. We also have a unilateral free trade agreement with Peru. We already have low or no tariffs with these countries that are already, we already have trading agreements with. And that, you've heard another number, you've probably heard a lot, 40% of the world's economy. We already have free trade acting across about 50% of that 40%. So we already have tariff reductions. They're not working for working families. But let's pile on some more. Let's look at what we're cutting tariffs on, because there's some really interesting and kind of ridiculous tariff cuts in this 18,000 number. One of my favorites is, and this is a, US, a, a tariff cut where the US would benefit. I want to be open my, about that. We are going to be cutting, cutting tariffs on skis made in the United States that are in, uh, exported to the country of Vietnam. I've not been. <laughs> I don't think there's much skiing in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Another one is uh, Alaskan caviar. We're going to lower ta tariffs on Alaskan caviar to TPP countries, particularly Vietnam. Um, that's about $150,000 worth of export business. So we're losing tariffs on that, but it is such a tiny number of the actual business that the tariff cuts are slim to none. And I don't think that TPP countries are going to suddenly go, we're going to buy tons of Alaska ca caviar now. And those kind of examples are riddled throughout this 18,000 number. And it's one that's being put out there as one of the biggest benefits. But there's a big problem with that. A lot of them don't apply to us. We already have reduced or non-existent tariffs with a large number of these countries. Um, and I, coming from a public sector union background, thank you, Rob, for being here today, um, I also think about taxes as a positive. Taxes are what fund our public services. Taxes are what fund our roads, our clean air, our clean water. And while taxes and tariffs are not exactly the same thing, one thing that's really interesting about cutting tariffs is that reduces revenue for our government to do things that benefit us all. Um, and then the last thing on tariffs I want to say, because, and I really appreciate that most of our panelists brought up the fact that there's a lot of environmental damage potentials in the TPP, but one of the tariff cuts that some of you in this room have actually already heard me say that drives me insane are tariff cuts on shark fin, tariff cuts on whale meat, Tariff cuts on elephant ivory. These are tariffs that no matter what other reasons it, they were put into place, they are protectionist of endangered species. And they are designed to de-incentivize trade in products made from endangered species. The TPP is going to erase those tariffs designed to protect endangered species across our globe. Um, on a broader level, Getting rid of tariffs is getting rid of protectionism. Again, ooh, great, yeah, we don't want protectionism. But wait a second, there's some other non-trade related elements of the TPP that are just a new form of protectionism, again, say it with me, for the 1% and multinational corporations. Um, one thing that I find very interesting is the new uh, rights and extensions of patents and copyrights in the TPP. This is a new form of protectionism. So instead of putting tariffs, which would potentially benefit governments to then be used to benefit more people, we're now looking at patent protections where big pharmaceutical companies can charge thousands and thousands and thousands of more dollars than the free market would bear for drugs that are desperately needed for people across the globe. That's protectionism. It's protectionism for the corporations. It's not protectionism for our countries and our working families. Um, and I really wanted to emphasize that. And the last thing, and I really, again, appreciate what Shanti brought up about how we are not anti-trade. We want a fair model of trade. And we've traded with TPP countries long before free trade agreements existed. We have current free trade agreements with other TPP countries. Um, this is not about this is the only way to increase trade. 
This is about taking a broken model that we've learned is broken through NAFTA and CAPTA and expanding it. Exporting our very unfortunate corporate rule model here in the United States to other countries so that multinationals get away with having few to lower barriers while working families, and particularly in Southeast Asia, migrant workers do not enjoy anything additional from the TPP. Um, so that is pretty much the conclusion of my comments on protectionism and tariffs.